Hi, I'm Eric Bowling in for Bill O'Reilly. Thanks for watching us tonight. Let's get right to our top story, the aftermath of the Democratic Convention. Hillary Clinton gave voters the hard sell last night, unleashing everything she's got against Donald Trump. Donald Trump can't even handle the rough and tumble of a presidential campaign. He loses his cool at the slightest provocation. When he's gotten a tough question from a reporter, when he's challenged in a debate, when he sees a protester at a rally, imagine, if you dare, imagine, imagine him in the Oval Office facing a real crisis. A man you can bait with a tweet is not a man we can trust with nuclear weapons. And in the end, it comes down to what Donald Trump doesn't get. America is great because America is good. Trump was on the receiving end of a blistering attack by Democrats all week and seems to have had enough. The things that were said about me. I mean, should I go through some of the names? Should I? No. I, you know what? I wanted to. I wanted to hit a couple of those speakers so hard. I would have hit them. No, no. I was going to hit them, so I was all set. And then I got a call from a highly respected governor. How's it going, Donald? I said, well, it's going good, but they're really saying bad things about me. I'm going to hit them so hard. I was going to hit one guy in particular, a very little guy. I was going to hit this guy so hard, his head would spin. He wouldn't know what the hell happened. And he came out of nowhere. Mm. Wow. Joining us now with reaction from Dallas, Trump campaign national spokeswoman Katrina Pearson. Now, Katrina, the very little guy Mr. Trump was, refer was referring to in the speech, <laughs> I'm guessing he tweeted today about my little Michael Bloomberg. Is that who he was, he was talking about? Well, Mr. Trump didn't say, so I won't say, but I think your inference could be spot on. Uh, Mr. Trump uh, was definitely defending himself. And, you know, I think uh, the, the, the quotes from Hillary Clinton you just played are really indicative on why Mr. Trump is beating her in the polls right now, because people are tired of this make-believe fantasy land that everything is okay and there's nothing to see here, move along. We finally have a candidate that's willing to stand up for himself and fight back for a change. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, that Michael Bloomberg speech, it seemed that it, it was very, very, it was very attackish and it kind of shocked me a little bit too, but listen, this is what, this is what politics are all about. Let's talk about what you just mentioned, uh, Mrs. Clinton's comments last night. She was hitting uh, Mr. Trump or Donald Trump pretty hard on, on this tweeting issue. Now, Donald Trump has done very well with Twitter and it gets his message out there, but she says that because you can instigate a Twitter fight with him, he may not be the guy that has access to the nuclear, to the button. Well, I mean, this is another reason why Mrs. Clinton struggles with younger people. I mean, this is a medium of choice, and it's been one of the ways that Mr. Trump has been able to, to fight back against the liberal media that has tried to paint his policies for him. And Twitter has been a great resource for Mr. Trump, and there are millions of millennials who are on Twitter and who are getting his message. Mm -hmm. the, um, the, the, the word is that he and Mrs. Clinton will be receiving national security briefings coming very soon. What, what will Donald do with those? Well, he's going to take them very seriously. You know, one of the things Mr. Trump has always said is that he wants to take in the information and let the generals make the decisions. And what we know with Hillary Clinton, particularly throughout this week, is there really was no mention of what was going to be changed. And we hear a lot of talk about her resume and her qualifications. But what's really important are the decisions that she's made while she had those titles, like when she was Secretary of State. And we have had an influx of refugees coming into this country. We see what's happening in other countries. And she wants to do more of that. Her plan, Eric, is to have more intelligence. But why didn't she do that while she was Secretary of State? Because now we know after the email investigation that she had intelligence and she misused that intelligence as well as when people died under her watch, she lied about it. And that's the case that's gonna be made moving forward. The Trump campaign is suggesting that maybe Hillary Clinton shouldn't have these national security briefings because of what happened with the email, with the FBI being under investigation with the FBI. Hillary Clinton camp says Donald shouldn't have it because of his comments about Russia looking for the 30 3,000 emails. Um, first of all, 
where did he mean was he serious about that he said he was tongue-in-cheek where is he oh it's absolutely tongue-in-cheek which is exactly why he included that the press will be uh, thankful in that comment but mr trump is absolutely right i mean now you have the department of justice that have reopened the investigation into hillary's emails simply because there needs to be consequences as the fbi has even mr fbi director comey's even said that if, if that person had worked for him they'd probably lose their security clearance mr trump is not investigated by the fbi he hasn't done anything uh, that could thwart national security hillary clinton has that's the problem and that's the difference and that's why you've seen at this last convention where people are still wondering is she even going to address the email situation is she going to talk about benghazi because that's what people want to know about her it's why her poll numbers have tanked in honesty and i think it's really important moving forward katrina last night one of the uh, probably the most compelling speaker for me clearly was not hillary clinton i think what the most compelling was kazir khan he's the father of the muslim u.s soldier from virginia who was killed in action um, and he said, uh, Donald, you haven't sacrificed anything. How, how do you respond to something like that? It, it was an emotional moment. It was absolutely an emotional moment. And, you know, we, everyone sympathizes with any parent that's lost a child under any circumstances. But if we go back to day one of the DNC convention, where there was not a single American flag in the arena, and in fact, Eric, there was a Palestinian flag, and on the outside of the arena, they were burning American flags as well as Israeli flags in their protest. Uh, so we have a situation where we have to put American citizens First, we cannot delay this any longer. And it is truly unfortunate that we have lost so many lives because of terrorism. But we have hundreds of millions of people in this country that we cannot succumb to, to people's feelings. It's about national security and the best interests of the people who are here. And the policies under uh, even Bill Clinton letting Osama bin Laden go, moving forward 15 years, we've been in a war and Hillary Clinton says, we need to work with our allies. Well, where has that been this whole time? All right, Katrina, before we go, as a woman, do you feel any sense of history being made here with Hillary being the, the first female presidential candidate in, of a major party in America? I don't. It was actually a little anticlimactic for myself, uh, simply because it's unfortunate that, you know, all women really want to see a woman as president, but not under these circumstances, not someone that's been investigated by the FBI, who left Americans uh, in Libya to die, who's lied, who's cheated, and over the last three years collected $22 million from special interests in trade and from global corporations, and is now out there lying to the American public. It is exactly what Barack Obama said in 2008. Hillary Clinton will say anything and change nothing. And most Americans realize that. All right, Katrina, thank you very much. Now let's bring in Democratic strategist it. Bernard Whitman, author of the new book, 52 Reasons to Vote for Hillary. Bernard, you listen to Katrina Pearson. They, there's some compelling pushback on Hillary Clinton's speech last night by the, by the Trump camp. Here's the thing that Katrina, and more importantly, Donald Trump does not get. And it was summed up in three words by Hillary Clinton last night. E pluribus unum. We are all in this together. It was the most profound moment for me of the entire convention. It's something that the Trump campaign simply doesn't get. And I think that uh, Hillary Clinton needed to do three things last night. Number one, she needed to draw a sharp contrast with Donald Trump's vision for America and policies. I think she nailed that. Number two, I think she needed to be real. I think she needed to be authentic. I think, and do you I think, think she was? I think she needed to acknowledge Wasn't that, that a lot of people... Wasn't opportunity for no, her to, to, to be you know, transparent, to be heartfelt? Here's and, why. and what I heard was, yes, the beginning of the speech was like that, but then the, the, the basis, the meat of that speech was attacking Donald but Eric, Trump. But Eric, she drew That's a contrast. That's unifying? She drew a contrast with Donald Trump. Donald Trump believes in division, devices, and negativity. Means meeting, means we're together Democrats or Democrats, or the Republicans, country. independents. Well, I think she took she a caught, lot of shots at Republicans. No, she, she, made a, she made a great effort to draw clear distinctions about how we have two different worldviews. One in which we're stronger through our diversity, we're, a, we're inclusive, we're forward-looking, we're optimistic, we believe this country is the greatest country on earth. In Cleveland, all you heard was negativity, talking down the economy, talking down our military, talking down our veterans, complaining. I mean, Donald Trump literally, well, she painted as a picture Khan said, of a wonderful like, guy, everything was good, did no. she not? She, she said things are great, but are they can they, be, but they I mean, can be yeah, so you're gonna, Bernie, much You're going to look in that camera right now and tell America that things are great. Now, they may be no. great for Wall Street, and they may be great for people on the two coasts, but flyover country saying, our wages aren't up. Our unemployment is still too high. 
growth. We got a number today. Mm -hmm. Growth uh, GDP is subpar that's exactly by a why mile. She said, that's exactly why she said, you know what, thank you, Bernie Sanders, for bringing issues of, of social justice and income inequality to the fore. We created 15 million jobs. It's the longest and biggest recovery ever in history. Has it been enough? Absolutely not, which is why her first days in office are going to be spent putting together the biggest single jobs creation program since World War II. Yes, before I let you go, um, it felt like this is a, the third term President Obama. She delivered what President Obama would have been delivering had he been on that stage. Where am I wrong? No, I don't think it's either the third term of President Obama or the third term of Bill Clinton. I think this is going to be the first term and hopefully the second term of Hillary Rodham why? Clinton. So what's different? Because she is committed to bringing people together, working Obama across party lines. Look, President Obama, I think, deserves a huge credit, but one thing he was challenged with was working with the other what side. Is she I think Where Hillary is she different Clinton, than President Obama? Because, she sounded like she was up because because Hillary almost Clinton, the, the exact same I think it's a great recipe. question, Eric, and I think that uh, moderate Republicans and conservative-leading independents need to understand Hillary Clinton has a record of three decades of working across the aisle to do things like provide health care to Again, children, eight million children. She did that with Republicans. equal being qualified. And that's where I think a lot of people... There is no wrong. question Bernie, she is more go. qualified than Donald Ran Trump. up against our break. Thank you, Bernie. Thank you. Next on the rundown, the conventions are wrapped. Where does the race stand as they answer the final 100-day sprint to election? Stay tuned. In the campaign 2016 segment tonight, the state of the presidential race, the conventions are done, and according to the latest Real Clear Politics average of presidential polls, Donald Trump is tied with Hillary Clinton, with each at 44.3%. But will a Democratic convention change all that? Joining us now with reaction from Washington, Republican pollster Kristen Soltis Anderson. And along with us is Simon Rosenberg, the president of NDN, a center left think Th think tank. Simon, I can't believe it. <laughs> Democrats finished the, their convention and they're still tied. No, I'm just well, kidding. I know there's going to be a bounce. But what do you think? A, a, give, us, give us a sense of the bounce you think she'll get. Listen, I think if we're ahead by two or three points by the end of next week, I think Democrats will be happy. I think, look, Democrats know this is going to be a close race. I, there wasn't a lot of, there's no victory laps going on. We know Trump is an unorthodox candidate. You know, we went through a tough election in 2000, which we thought we were going to win, and we didn't at the end. So, you know, I think the, I think the Democrats are very committed and, and very focused. And let me just say one thing. The other thing to watch, though, is what happens with the state polls. That's probably going to take, like, another week after the national polls settle yeah, down. Yeah, they're, they're pretty jammed up. Those state polls, yeah. the battleground states, are pretty tied up. Yeah. I just may ask you this before I go to Kristen. Yeah. Um, did, did Hillary Clinton get the Sanders voters? I think we, I, I will tell you that I think the, the Clinton campaign did a far better job bringing Bernie along over the last couple of weeks than I ever thought was going to happen. I think we're in far better shape, frankly, with the Sanders world than I thought we were going to be. So I think we feel pretty good about where we are right now with, right. with Team Sanders. Kristen, did, did, do you think Hillary brought the Sanders voters along um, to, you know, to the end, the hundred, last 100 days coming up? You know, there was a big section in the middle of her speech where she pivoted from sort of describing her own character and describing Donald Trump's character and making that case to really focusing on progressive issues, talking about repealing Citizens United, talking about taxing the rich more, talking about reforming immigration, talking about the sorts of things that the Democratic Party's base really gets excited about. And so while it was interesting, early in the convention, you had Elizabeth Warren speak, you had Bernie Sanders speak, you know, sort of the, the early nights were, I think, most focused on let's heal the party, let's get the Democratic base in. Hillary Clinton didn't drop that message even when she was giving her acceptance speech on Thursday night. So I think she, she was really focused on all the way up until the end, even after she'd secured the nomination, making sure these folks don't go rogue again. In the same token, did Donald Trump unify the, the, the Republicans, the establishment, and the, you know, the outsider army that he's compiled? Well, what's interesting about Donald Trump's speech is that he did not actually make a lot of overtures to ideological conservatives. If Hillary Clinton was making overtures to ideological progressives and saying, I'm one of you, Donald Trump's speech didn't really make those same kinds of overtures. Instead, I think Donald Trump's main message, again, was, I'm going to keep you safe. I'm going to make America great again. Uh, and, and that's the sort of thing that, rather than really speaking to the ideological right, speaks to these voters who may be kind of in the middle, but are just frustrated. They're just folks that think things are on the wrong track. And that's about seven out of 10 Americans who in polls say they think things are on the wrong track. So it is interesting to see how they're trying to build their coalitions and to what extent they think their ideological bases matter. All right, Simon, I, you know, I spent a lot of time in Philadelphia, I, Cleveland and Philadelphia, but I will tell you that Bernie Sanders voters, 
they're not in line. I, you may say they are, and they may end up voting for her, but I, you walk around there, they're anarchists. They want change. They don't want more of the same. They don't want the Democrat just for the sake of the Democrat. They're a different breed. I think there's an opportunity, well, it, 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 if not Donald Trump voters, but maybe to keep them away from the polling place come November. Yeah, it's possible. I mean, I, you know, look, I mean, we'll see where we are next week. Certainly, you know, I think, look, both of these candidates are going to get to 45, 46 percent, no matter what happens, right? Trump, part of what's going on is that Trump was underperforming, and you've seen him get a bounce in part because he's reclaiming real estate that he was always going to get anyway. And so the real question is, who goes up above 45, 46? How do they get there? We've got work to do with the Sanders world. I'm not telling you it's done. I think we did a good job, but Bernie Sanders has said he's going to campaign vigorously uh, with yeah. Secretary Clinton, and I think we're going to need it to, uh, there, keep, to continue group, to bring them they're along. They're young, yeah. they're mad, they, they, yeah. I don't think they're going to vote for, for her no matter what, or him maybe, but neither we'll one. See. Very quickly, Kristen, I just, 10 seconds, 68% uh, in the recent CNN poll say Hillary Clinton, not honest, not trustworthy. Can she turn that around? It's going to be very hard. That's one of those numbers that's baked in. Instead, she's got to make the, the message clear. You may not trust me, you may not think I'm honest, but at least I'm going to keep America safe. Donald Trump is a risk. That's the message she really tried to drive on Thursday night. All right. Very good. Kristen Simon, thank you very much. Up next, family members of fallen police officers speak out at the convention last night. But was it just a hollow gesture by Democrats? That debate, moments away. In the Impact segment tonight, Democrats and the police. The second night of the Democratic Convention featured mothers of African Americans killed by police officers and others. Last night, family members of slain police officers had their moment on the convention stage. When I lost Thor, I had no idea it was possible to lose so much in an entire lifetime, much less in a single moment. Let us honor all of the fallen officers who weren't named here today by acting as our officers did, helping others, bridging communities, and building peace. Despite that moving tribute, critics say that Democrats are still only pay paying lip service to the mounting threats our police face. Another chilling example came overnight as a San Diego police officer was shot and killed in the line of duty, his partner wounded. Join us now with Reaction, host of Justice with Judge Janine, Janine Pirro. And along with Janine is criminal defense attorney Andel Brown. Andel, I, I, I went to that convention and I saw, starting from the very beginning, when Debbie Wasserman Schultz was removed, or she removed herself from the chairwomanship of the, of the convention, she was replaced by Stephanie Rawlings Blake, now the mayor of Baltimore who decided that rioting was going to be okay, and if people wanted, to, if, if uh, Black Lives Matter, whoever wanted to riot, they were going to be allowed to riot in a city in America. Your thoughts? Well, let me back up for a second. She never said you're allowed to riot and it wasn't a, a Black Lives Matter riot. What she said was the people that are out there rioting and doing damage, we have to protect our officers' safety. Our, the officers were outnumbered at that point in time. We're not going to put them into a situation that's going to do more harm than good. Well, she actually, she, she, wait, she so gave them space to riot. She why said we're going to the give them mayor, space. I'm sorry, Eric, but Jump why in, does a mayor make a decision about whether the police are going to be or have sufficient numbers to be protected. That's not her job. She should keep her nose out of it. And even assuming that you're right, what she did was wrong. It's none of her business. The cops decide whether or not they can go forward. And the chief of police at the time made the very same decision. Who was the chief of police? Yeah, who did he, he work for? Who did he work safe. for? She rather, he made that rather than rehashing her decisions then, was that the right choice to make the chairwoman of the Democrat convention? Well, I, I think the city of Being Baltimore, as controversial yeah, as the that city decision of Baltimore was. is controversial, but I think everyone is looking for guidance on what's going to happen in the relationship between the community and the police department. And I think no one is better than, than bring the controversy out front and let's deal with it. We saw those, the, the, the family of slain police officers talking to the crowd. We saw the sheriff from Dallas speaking to the crowd about what's going on in this country. It's a conversation we need to have. And Judge, during that family, uh, some of the speeches by family members or, or during one of the, the police officers that was speaking, there was some yelling from the crowd, Black Lives Matter, Black Lives Matter. And I have to tell you, Eric, I have a real problem with that. The whole concept of Black Lives Matter is is that it's a, the, the genesis. It began in Ferguson with Michael Brown and with Trayvon Martin. 
All right, Trayvon Martin, the defendant, was acquitted. And in Ferguson, uh, Michael Brown, they didn't even bring charges against him. The Justice Department couldn't bring anything against him. So it was based on a lie, hands up, don't shoot. Now, this whole Black Lives Matter movement is based on something that is not true. And here's the bottom line. As a prosecutor, I prosecuted cops who didn't do their jobs. But there is a social contract in this country, and we have vigilante justice if we don't follow it. That means the police do their job, you don't like what they do, then you make a complaint. You don't go out and kill cops like five in Dallas because they're white. All right, so and, uh, stay in the convention here. Yeah. Now, do you think it was wise of the people who put this thing together to have the mothers of uh, Eric Garner and, and Michael Brown and, and the others have them first and talk about how their, their, their sons and their children were killed by cops. Why not have a moment where you bring out the parent, bring them together. The ones that came out last night, bring those mothers and family members along with these mothers and have a moment of unity. That would have worked. I'm glad Judge Pierre brought up the social contract that we have between the community and the police department, the great power, the great deference, the great honor that we give police department comes with great responsibility. And life and liberty are at stake every time an officer goes out into the streets, the life and liberties of ordinary Americans. And that's what those families represented. They represent people who lost life and liberty. All of them. Lost life both and liberty. Sides. Absolutely, yeah. on both sides. And in order for us to deal with it, we have to have this type of dialogue, not just people racing to one side with their talking points or racing to another side with their talking points, but a real conversation about how it's affecting both people. When I looked at the officer, one of the officers that died in Baton Rouge, I looked at his Facebook status that went viral, and he was talking right. about when he's not in uniform, he's looked at with suspicion right. yes, by one group, uh, and, and when he's in talking, uniform, he's looked you're, at you're, with you're, suspicion you're by another group. You're preaching to the choir right now. Everyone <laughs> agrees with that. My problem, my issue, and our issue has been, there was a moment that, that, that the Democrats could have used, and and brought some unity together between law enforcement and Black Lives Matter or mothers of, of, of uh, sons who were killed by officers. Putting them that, together they, is But there's unity. no but moral they equivalency ahead, there. Judge. Here's the thing. Michael Brown was a thug who engaged in a strong arm robbery and reached for a cop's gun. He, what he did was so outrageous that no charges, no wrongdoing against anyone. I'm sorry. I don't see the moral equivalency here. You focus if on a one cop case. Is, well, that is the genesis of Black Lives Matter. Charles Kinsey was a, was a therapist helping an autistic patient well, who shot with his hands up on his back. Yeah, that's well, that's know, another case. Okay, well, so we have Trayvon both sides. No, this, we have look, both sides look, and we have to look no at the whole picture. both sides here. The police have the power and the obligation to protect us. It's not a negotiation. They have a, it's they not something have to be responsible have, with that power. You know what? They have if to you have transparency like did, and I accountability for cops. that power. No, the if they do wrong, people you have to be able to see it. into their own hands. The courts do it. All right, we're going to have to leave it there. Obviously a hot debate that's going to stick around for a while. Judge, and Dell, thank you guys very much. Directly ahead, the head of the FBI sounding new alarms about ISIS threats to the homeland. Does Donald Trump or Hillary Clinton have the right plan to take them on? We'll be right back with that. In the Unresolved Problems segment tonight, the ISIS threat to America. This week, FBI Director James Comey issued a disturbing prediction about the next phase of the battle against the terror group. We can't take our eye off a what is largely a future threat, and that is at some point there's going to be a terrorist diaspora out of Syria like we've never seen before. Not all of the Islamic State's killers are going to die on the battlefield, hundreds and hundreds of them, when the coalition succeeds, and I'm confident it will, in crushing the Islamic State, through the fingers of that crush are going to come hundreds of really dangerous people, and they're going to flow out primarily towards Western Europe, but we might as well be right next door to Western Europe, given the ease with which people can travel. And this is an order of magnitude greater than any diaspora we've seen before. Well, those are some chilling words. Meantime, Hillary Clinton is ripping into Donald Trump's ISIS strategy. Donald Trump says, and this is a quote, I know more about ISIS than the generals do. No, Donald, you don't. Do you really think Donald Trump has the temperament to be commander in chief? Joining us now from Philadelphia with reaction, former State Department official David Tafuri and from Washington, Van Hipp, a former deputy assistant secretary for the U.S. Army Van. I'm, I'm listening to James Comey. That, that's pretty dire. That's a pretty dire prediction. Even if we put ISIS down, there's going to be a terror network that slips through. 
We'll probably go to Western Europe, but boy, I look at our borders. Our borders are just as, as uh, Swiss cheese as, as Europe's are. Yeah, Eric, it sounds to me like uh, uh, the FBI director supports Donald Trump's plan to secure the borders of this country uh, to keep us safe. And I got to tell you, Hillary Clinton was one of her uh, new great ideas to, to defeat radical Islam. I just wish she had shared some of these ideas with President Obama over the last eight years, uh, particularly when General Lloyd Austin, uh, back in 2010, when we had 90 percent of ISIS's capability wiped out, urged the president to leave a small residual force so it wouldn't reconstitute itself. President Obama didn't listen to his generals. I wish he had weighed in with President Ob Obama then. Mm -hmm. David, um, President Obama has said he wanted more Syrian refugees to come here. I think we let some six or 7,000 in so far this year. He wanted tens of thousands. Given what we now hear from James Comey, is this a, a good strategy for Hillary Clinton, if she were the president, to, to uh, employ? ISIS attacked Iraq exactly two years ago. I've spent a lot of time in Iraq since then, more than 10 visits. Comey is right. We're going into a new stage in the bloody battle against ISIS. They've lost more than half their territory in Iraq. They're losing territory in Syria. They're about to make a last stand in Mosul. My contacts tell me we're going to go into Mosul in, in two months at the earliest, maybe in uh, later at the latest in six months. There will be refugees or will, will be people fleeing from Syria and Iraq. Some of them could be ISIS. We have to protect our borders, yes, but remember, not one Syrian refugee has engaged in terrorism in the U.S. So right now, that is not what is causing terrorism in the U.S. Yet. Of course, we need to vet yet. any, David, we need to vet you're, any you're, refugees you know, who come all here. All it takes is one. I mean, is this really a smart strategy to continue to take these Syrian refugees, as James Comey points out, as ISIS is being defeated on the battlefield, they're going to spread out through the refugee program. Maybe Trump is right. Stop all refugee programs right now. Eric, well, remember, Eric. remember, I served in I served in Iraq, and I worked with Iraqis who ultimately became refugees and came back to the U.S. The refugee programs often reward people who work with the U.S. in Iraq. So you're, you're and equating Syria. Iraqi we can't take refugees away. with Syrian refugees with Syrian refugees who who are, as Comey points out, not me. Comey points out are likely ISIS fighters. Remember, yeah. the refugee program is a reward for those who support democracy, who help the U.S. abroad. Right. We only take a very small number of Syrian refugees right yeah. now, and none yeah. of them small, have engaged in terrorism. Small 6,500 so far this year. Go ahead, Van. I'm sorry hey, to Eric, cut you off. Eric, go back to the, his predecessor, Robert Mueller. He testified to Congress a couple years ago that in 2012, 59,000 people from countries other than Mexico, including Yemen and Pakistan and Syria and Iran, were caught illegally coming to this country. Well, where are the ones we didn't catch? Where are they tonight in America? What are they doing? How about the thousands that we have caught uh, who have uh, Middle Eastern names, who have changed their names to Hispanic names to fool authorities? And don't forget the radical Imam cleric Saeed Jaziri, who called for the assassination and execution of the Danish cartoonist Kurt Westergaard. We called him the back Van, of the truck think, of the BMW do you think, trying to come across the Mexican border. Do you, they know how to get here. Do you think Angela Merkel, Van, do you think she's rethinking this idea of taking a million, a million refugees oh, as a, a good idea? She's got to. I mean, she's got to. I mean, that's, you got to tell you, look, it's, it's great that all these people want to come here, but I'm for protecting the American people first. And I think that's what Donald, that's why Donald Trump has resonated. He gets it. The challenge against radical Islam is the challenge of our time, and he wants to keep Americans safe. First okay. and foremost, that's why we have a federal government to provide right. for the common defense. David, 10 seconds, final thought. Look. Uh, the refugees are not what's causing terrorism here. None of the recent terrorist attacks in the U.S. have been caused by refugees. Yes, we have to monitor ref refugee program. Yes, we have to refugees coming. We have to uh, vet refugees coming over here. But we shouldn't turn off the refugee program because it has important public policy benefits for the U.S. and for Europe. But yes, also the Middle Eastern Gulf countries right. should take more of these refugees, and we need to pressure them to do that. Got Keep America safe it. first. Got to leave it right there, gentlemen. Thank you very much. Coming up, former N Navy SEAL and friend of American sniper Chris Kyle sounds off about the grim state of the war on terror his powerful interview with Bill O'Reilly right after this thanks for staying with us I'm Eric Bowling in for Bill O'Reilly and in the personal story segment tonight the state of the war on terror both the Republican and Democratic conventions honored members of the military paying tribute to the heroic sacrifices they've made defending our country Recently, Bill O'Reilly sat down with Kevin Lace, a former Navy SEAL who served with American sniper Chris Kyle. Kevin wrote the new book, The Last Punisher, about their time in Iraq.
Mr. Lace, I thought your uh, book was very informative, but what struck me was the SEAL's attitude toward the enemy, the mooj, as you guys called him. I mean, was he a person to you? Was he a vile human being? Was he evil? What? Well, I mean, I joined the Navy in response to 9-11. That's what propelled me to join the Navy. And I realized at some point in the time, I was gonna meet the enemy on the battlefield. And it's, it's a business decision. It's business out there. We are instruments to carry out, you know, uh, eliminating the enemy. And I felt extremely comfortable doing that. And um, that's what I was trying to do. Yeah, because so there are portions in your book where uh, you and your guys, and including the American sniper, Chris Kyle, um, you celebrate blowing their heads off. I mean, they weren't really, they're were almost like animals to you guys, the mooj. I wouldn't say animals per se, I'd say really bad people. And you base that on what? Based on their actions, what they did to, to terrorize. And we talk about in the book what they did to these cities. Uh, and Ramadi was the focus. We teamed up with the village elders and did the tribal engagement model. And they helped us identify who the bad people were. And we were able well, to. What did they do? Them. Tell the people what they did. What I mean, the you know, do? I mean, you're seeing on the news today, you're looking at uh, car bombings, you're looking at suicides, you're looking at mass killings. And that's what we saw on the same scale. But Torture? Today, torture absolutely and we were willing to meet that and and the problem with what happened in 2006 is we won and we didn't stay the course we didn't course. stay in iraq and yeah, now we the have history enemy. shows that 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 battle uh, in the uh, surge was won do you believe that the people that you fought in iraq are the same kind of people that were fighting in isis now are they the same guys i think they're uh they're level two um, because they've learned from what we've done over there. They're able to go ahead and operate freely. There's no infrastructure. The, uh, what we handed the Iraqis wasn't carried over. They're able to regain, get stronger, and they have a bigger footprint. They're better in social media and have a wider reach. Did they're you ever feel sorry for a guy that you killed? No, I didn't. And the reason why is every single person that we engaged was a bad person. They met the rules of engagement and they were bad you know, by our government and by their actions and we eliminated them accordingly. When you worked with Kyle and you were an advisor on the movie, I just want to get the bad guys, but if I can't see him, I can't shoot him. Was there a difference between your mentality and Chris Kyle's mentality? I think so in a, in a small capacity because I was a new guy. This was my first deployment in 2006 for Ramadi, so I didn't know what to expect. And I became more comfortable as the time went on. Um, and I think we had the same indifference towards you know the enemy and everybody else in the platoon had the same thing. These are the bad guys. They harm our brothers and sisters on the battlefield. And it's our job to get out in front and attack All right. them. So you didn't, uh, you know, there wasn't any remorse or conscience or anything like that, you felt that this was the right thing to do, morally right thing to do, and you were doing it. Absolutely. You know, the violence that met the rules of engagement, um, and we met them back with the same amount of violence and were ruthless towards them, and that's what won the Battle of Ramadi. There are a lot of people in the United States that don't like you and don't like Chris Kyle and, and feel that you're, for some reason, um, bad because you're doing these kinds of things. Have you ever encountered those people? Have you debated them? Uh, not specifically. And, you know, what I want to do with the book was to show, hey, these are the type of people that go that do that job. You know, when the raid for bin Laden comes up, you know, who do they call? You know, they call special operations to go and do that job. They need to know what we do and why we do it. Right. We talked about mm -hmm. we meet the enemy with ruthless, you know, aggression because they are ruthless to our people. Um, and it's a business deal. That's but the, back here as a civilian, nobody's ever uh, taken you to task or asked you, you know, why did you do that stuff? No. And I wanted this book to be the reason why I tell them, to show them how we did it and Good. why we did it. I'm glad. Well, it's a fascinating book, and we appreciate you coming in, Kevin. Thank you very Thanks, much. Thanks, sir. When we come back, an ugly report out today casts new fears about the American economy. Which presidential candidate will be best for your financial security? Upcoming. In the back of the book segment tonight, the presidential candidates and your financial security. If you listen to Hillary Clinton last night, the economy practically has never been better. I don't think... President Obama and Vice President Biden get the credit they deserve for saving us from the worst economic crisis of our lifetimes. Our economy is so much stronger than when they took office. Nearly 15 million new private sector jobs, 20 million more Americans with health insurance, and an auto industry that just had its best year ever. Now, that's real progress. But just hours after that speech, the Commerce Department released a Dow report about the U.S. Eco economic growth in the second quarter, coming in at just 1.2 percent. That's less than half of what economists were expecting. The report seems to line up much better with Donald Trump's take on the economy. 
They're not talking about the fact that many people in our country are making less money today in terms of real wages than they were making 18 years ago. They're not talking about the fact that our jobs are leaving our country, that our jobs are pouring into Mexico. Joining us now from Tampa with Reaction, Democratic strategist Jessica Ehrlich, and with us here, Carrie Sheffield, the writer and political analyst. Jessica, you heard Hillary Clinton's taking credit for amazing things that President Obama did. Um, yet, Donald Trump points out, wages have been stagnant. They may even be flattened down under President Obama. Household incomes are down under President Obama. Why is this a victory lap? Well, it wasn't necessarily a victory lap. It was the way she started out what is going to be, I would think, an incredible and very strong economic platform that we saw her push again today as she went on her bus tour through the Rust Belt, through working class areas, focused on the middle class economy, um, making sure that we have more job growth going forward and actually addressing all of the issues that Donald Trump did. I mean, those have been Democratic talking you know, points just, now for quite some time. What happens when you do these bus tours? And I, believe me, I know because I just got off of the, the extended <laughs> one. Well, you, you go through these small towns. These aren't people who are stock traders. They're not Wall Street uh, investors. Right. They're average people who aren't experiencing the growth and, and euphoria that she points out. Well, w what she was pointing to more is actually the recovery. We were on the verge of a complete massive meltdown that was gonna lead us into possibly a Great Depression again, as worse or worse than what we had back in the 30s. So we were able to avoid that. Is there still more growth to be had? Absolutely. Is wage, you know, the differences, that has got to change. We need equal pay for women. All these things have to happen. Right. But we Jessica, need to have I get Congress Carrie working here, cause, together. Because Jessica, uh, Jessica points out growth, and then we this number we got today, 1.2% GDP, which is, half of what economists were expecting. <laughs> Yes, uh, because liberal policy is restricting business formation. It's killing community banks. Dodd-Frank, Harvard just came out with a study about this. Dodd-Frank has killed community banks, particularly banks owned by people of color, African Americans. People are not living the American dream because of regulation like Dodd-Frank that was started and Karen, passed through by Democrats. But American people don't care about the banks. They want to know about no, their wages. They want lending. to know about their savings. Well, let's talk about wages and, and uh, just the overall economy. So I heard no recognition of the financial crisis and responsibility that was created by Democrats who forced banks to lend to subprime borrowers who should not have bought these houses. That triggered the domino effect that killed wages. Right. It was liberal policy. Jess, I don't have a lot of time. Just tell me what's the difference yeah. between President Obama's economic policy and, and Hillary Clinton's very quickly if you can. I, I can't find yeah, it. No, oh, there absolutely is. I think what we're going to see more with Hillary is what similarly what we had under Bill Clinton. Um, I think there's going to be more smart regulation, not just oh, no, great, no, great. I got to go more regulation. No, you know what? Just what we need. No, Carrie, you're going to go. I'm sorry. It's, 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 Carrie regulation just, is thank you very much. Families. Up ahead, two things you absolutely cannot miss on TV this weekend. We've got special sneak peeks right after this. Before we go tonight, I'll be locking myself inside my man cave to watch two shows this weekend. The new episodes of Legends and Lies and Waters World. This week's Legends and Lies takes a fascinating look at George Washington and his time as the nation's first president. I do solemnly swear to faithfully execute the office of the president of the United States. Indeed. The episode airs Sunday at 8 p.m. Eastern right here on FNC. And don't forget about the companion book, which you can get for free if you sign up for a premium membership on BillOReilly.com. Also, don't miss an all-new Waters World with Jesse invading a Justin Bieber concert. Who is this? Um, I don't know. Who's this? Was he the one that did Make America Great? That was Trump. Have you ever seen him before? No. He was the president during the 80s. I wasn't around in the 80s. I don't know. That sounds about right. Waters World airs Saturday at 8 p.m. Eastern here on FNC. Plus, a reminder, we have an all-new podcast on BillOReilly.com and iTunes called The Contributing Factor. I was on it last month, and its coverage of the conventions was outstanding. So you want to check that out as soon as you can. The latest episode with former Navy SEAL Kevin Lace is on the BillOReilly.com homepage right now. And please don't forget about my book, Wake Up America, in its fourth week on the New York Times bestseller list. It's the new companion piece to Hillary Clinton's It Takes a Village. Just kidding about that part. Got all that? 
That's it for us tonight. Thanks for watching. I'm Eric Boeing. Bill O'Reilly will be back on Monday. And please remember, the spin stops right here because we're looking out for you.